Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Hello, welcome to Asia Tech Podcast Stories. We're all about the stories that make the Asian tech ecosystem so exciting, so dynamic. And to get a better handle of that, we're going to look at the business of rating startups in Asia today, delivering some kind of transparency to the world of private equity and venture capital investment. Being on both sides of the table is going to give us a better understanding of the world of startups. And we're also going to look at what makes a great startup ecosystem. So to help us understand all that a little better, I'm joined by James Jancotti, CEO of OddUp, a startup rating ecosystem all the way from Hong Kong. James, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Well, it's great to have you here. You know, from Hong Kong originally, we're going to talk a little bit about your background because there's a bit of a journey there as well. So if people are wondering where that accent comes from, just a quick heads up. Where are you from originally, James? Uh, originally a Melbourne boy from Australia. I th think we've probably, you're probably the second or third Melbourne boy we've had on this show. There seems to be producing a lot of startups and a lot of people from that side of the world. So we'll probably talk about that a bit as well in the context of, you know, what makes great startup cities. So let's start with Odd Up first. I mean, I described it as a startup rating, e so a startup rating system. Um, you can give us a better handle of what actually is and what kind of problems you're trying to solve. Well, uh, maybe I'll talk about where the problem was and then what we tried yeah. to, to do to solve it. There's a couple of other platforms around the world that has a, have a lot of data, particularly U.S. data. And one of the frustrating things about when you start a fund or you're an investor who wants to get into startups is information, particularly in Asia, is very, very hard to get. Um, if you're an English uh, English speaker and, and, and reader, looking at anything in, in China is going to be a problem, anything in different um locations is a problem so you don't actually know what's going on um, but one of the things that I saw as a problem particularly when I was uh, an investor was you know how can I get data on startups and how can I get a view on startups because it's good to hear all these funding stories but let's look into more analysis um, and so one of the problems I found uh, with my co-founder is that there was just very, very little information on Asian startups at all. Um, there was a couple of blogs, but blogs only tell you, you know, uh, uh, the, the, you know, a very small amount of the story as a full story. And so coming back, coming from a, a, a typical research side um, investment banking background, when I look at a stock which is on the market, such as Apple or Facebook, I know exactly what's going on with that company and I can make a decision. But for startups, we don't have that. And so that's where really where Odup was born. And uh, originally it was, you know, we tried it as an idea in Hong Kong, see if it worked. And then it exploded, of course, into China and now into India. Right. Gotcha. So you came from the investment banking side of the world. Let's put that into context. For people who haven't had the opportunity to work in investment banking, you would have had teams of people who research mm -hmm potential stock acquisitions or potential buys or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. you'd had analysts and so on, you know, just compare that to what is out there in the private equity scene, especially in startups. I mean, was it sort of, I mean, was it night and day in terms of, you know, the kind of access you had to information? Oh, absolutely. So, you know, the unfair advantage of a lot of research analysts in investment banks is all the data is public. So anyone can actually find that if you've, you know, search on search on Google and spend two seconds searching the stock code, you can find out summary financials, balance sheets, you name it, you can get those numbers. Of course, if you want to go into details of if it's a good investment, that's where you'll need to um, spend a little money and get access to a portal. But in general, mm -hmm. if you're a whiz on Excel, you can put all this stuff together pretty quickly. Um, but for startups, good luck on that. <laughs> There's just nothing out there until, of course, we came along. So it, it, this is one of the things that we, we want to give um, uh, investors the ability to understand a startup's investment potential like they would look at a stock, a stock that's currently listed on an exchange. And so this is where, you know, this is the end goal and it's already, we've already built a lot of that. Um, and that's what we want to focus on particularly. And, and, and you're right. In an investment bank, it's so hard. It's so easy because you've got so many resources of available to you but if you're a single angel investor then you know you're not going to have a team of 50 analysts looking for something you're going to look for it yourself and you're going to trawl through google you're going to try and find something and hopefully our platform does that for you very fast um, i want to know a little bit more about the kind of information that you are mm -hmm. first of all what you're getting and what you're sharing with these private investors i mean surely the challenge here is that in an investment bank as you said a lot of the 
companies you're dealing with are publicly traded, so they have some kind of responsibility to make all that information public, right? And they have mm -hmm. the resources to be able to crunch that information. But if you're dealing with a startup, you know, this could be two guys working on an app or so how, how does that happen? How do you get that information when they don't have the resources themselves to be able to share that with you? That's a really good point. And so one of the things we've focused our attention on, particularly as we've launched throughout Asia, is is really focusing on start with the basic data and then work from there. So typically, if we have never heard of a company before, all of a sudden they've raised a seed round, we've got a baseline of data. I how many people are working there? Who's the, which industry? What location? Is it a private or a public company? When did they launch? And who are the investors? And then, and so when we start putting the data together to, in order to get that, um, the, to sort of build a profile, we don't just look at what the starters, startups giving us. We actually look at a total picture of an industry, a location, the investors involved, mm -hmm. how they, how they're looking in their, in their digital assets, I, uh, app downloads. And, and there's a lot of data actually we can pull together to serve that information, even if they're a two member shop from, uh, Ho Chi Minh City. Gotcha. So what you're saying is, that data is out there, but it's on different platforms, different sites, and not necessarily the data is coming directly from the, the startup itself. Your job is to go and collate all that data from, from your sources and bring it together. Absolutely correct. Yes. Okay. Interesting. So what kind of people are interested in this data? I mean, obviously, there's a, there's a whole bunch of different kind of investors in the startup mm -hmm. scene. Who, who is most likely to use this kind of data? Yeah, so, so what we've, um, I'll work at both the B2B and the B2C level. So, um, surprisingly, there's a lot of different, and this is a surprise to us over our journey, different people that actually use our data for different reasons. So let's look at the sort of the biggest audience that we originally had. And that was the, the wannabe and angel investor. I, they're working in an investment bank. They've got probably a hundred thousand US dollars to invest in maybe five to 10 startups. And they look and, and we need, they need an analyst. And so we're that analyst for them doing all the research. Mm -hmm. The second thing is the, the banks. So we sell to companies such as Goldman, uh, BNP, Thomson Reuters, who want our data in order to um, to make their platforms um, sort of more rich because there's a lot of people in the P space that are looking at these companies in early stage that maybe it's Series D and E, they're looking at putting half a billion dollars down so it, or you know help them do an IPO. So that, that's another case. And the actual, which is probably one of the most surprising, is the startups themselves. Mm. So what we see on the platform is typically startups at C Seed and Series A, they're looking for investors, whereas when they're B, C, D, E, is they're actually looking for startups to acquire. And of course, you know, there's a lot of startups that fail along the way. And so if you're a Series B, company, you know, finding talent is always the hardest thing to do, but there could be companies that you could acquire that have that talent. So we're seeing a lot of later stage companies use our platform hunting for companies to acquire, which is um, a, a surprise for us, but also a good surprise because it means that, you know, a lot of these entrepreneurs who may not have had the success they wanted to may find success in another startup where they've acquired, been acquired. So are you delivering a rating in the same way that when you're in the investment banking world, you would have got a rating on a stock? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so this is probably the con most controversial, and that's why the traffic lights logo for Odup, the you know, green, mm -hmm. gold, and, and red come in, uh, which is the buy, hold, sell. Um, plus we have a score. So I can happily tell you about the differences between the two. Um, a lot of people uh, usually go, you know, if it's a good Odup score, does it mean – I should buy it? And the answer is no. So a, a good odd up score means the company's very, the risk is less. So a good odd up score means the company is, is doing well and it will probably survive a longer time. So in the greens, typically you see companies such as your Wee Labs or your, um, your Diddies, which are heavily funded and they're very, very strong. Whereas the lower ones are usually less funded. They're just starting out. But then we put a buy, hold, sell. So that will be related to the investment appetite of the investor who's using the platform, i.e. if your odd up score is bad, but you're a buy, it means that there's a whole heap of risk, but the rewards are going to be big versus a company that is uh, a high odd up score, but with a, a hold or a sell even, it means that the investors may have made their money by now. So, you know, we, there's a whole heap of ratings that we do based on the investment profile of where a, an investor is right. um, and different, different investors have different returns they're looking for. So you're actually doing a bit of due diligence on the investor as well and getting an understanding of their risk reward <laughs> profile, right? 
Well, yes, actually. I, I mean, it's fascinating. You know, we, we have a lot of investors on our platform. And, you know, the one thing that's happened since we started versus now is that the, the investments of the investors have increased more than sometimes the startups in some industries, the accelerators, mm. the co-working spaces, everything around startups has, has increased so much where, um, so there's more investors fighting for better deals. And so startups are now using the platform to go, actually, what's this investor like? Are they actually going to help me get right. there or are they not? And so the power's back on the startup again, which is probably really good for the startups who are listening out there. Yeah, yeah. So I imagine that's where that's a real sign of acceptance, where it's not just the investors using the platforms, it's the startups using the platforms as well. Yes. And I, I wonder if you have startups now looking at their ratings and let's say they have a, a buy rating against them or on their profile well that's great for them they can use that as a, a sales tool when they go to an investor right in the same way uh, do you have those kind of startups monitoring their 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 ratings in the same way a cfo would be watching their you know their star rating like in the investment banking world all the time <laughs> all the time is the answer um and the be that's the best types because what they're doing is feeding us more information about the company right. because our investors um, and a lot of startups I mean, I used to, you know, I used to be at that early stage of the seed. I thought my my company was going to be amazing. But you know, having said that, you know, we've we've worked hard bit hard to get to where we are. But very much in the early stages, I want to do everything I can to put my company forward, both for the the customers and also the investors. So what we do is what we find is that a lot of startups are providing us with more and more information, which gives us a more total picture of the company and. Investors that like where that stage that company is are actually eager to get there. And um, that's what we've found has worked the best. Um, and, and what I mean by the best is that if you were to go to a demo day, say 500 or YC, there's you know 50 to 100 companies. So which of those 50 companies should you spend time with and eventually invest in? And so we say the same thing for the startups. Our, our investors who use our platform are looking at 20,000 plus companies you want to be on their radar with as much information as possible. Otherwise, they're just going to go, you know what, you're just noise and I'm not interested. And so this is why we always tell startups, the more data you can give, the more the investors are happy with. Right. And, and a startup wouldn't necessarily know, the founders wouldn't necessarily know what kind of data they should be giving them, mm -hmm. giving you. So in a way, you're giving them best practices, right? I mean, the, they're not necessarily train, trained CFAs or lawyers. They don't know. I mean, often you've got two guys who are computer programmers. I mean, they don't mm -hmm. know anything about the world of finance, right? So what you're doing is you're kind of providing an interface between them and how they should be relating to the world of the investor, right? Yeah, and and I think what – I don't think there's any right or wrong way with how a founding team has been created. I think it's more a case of – if they want to speak to an investor and get funding, they need to understand that typically all the investors, most of the investors, not all, but most of the investors I've seen are very much numbers driven. So if they're not looking at numbers, then they, you know, they'll ask for, uh, uh, you know, income versus expensive balance sheets. You know, how are you tracking with all these? They want to look at data points. And so. Um, no matter if you come from a programming background or you're just in sales or so forth, the people who want to invest in you will always look at the numbers. Yeah. And so um, I think that's the one thing that hopefully our platform's teaching startups is that, you know, we do numbers because numbers is what the investors really want to see at the end of the day. And they're, they're looking at also, no matter if they want to support you and help you in the journey, they're also looking for an exit. So don't be illusioned that this is charity. It's, it's effectively an investment. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so you've done over 25,000 ratings on your startups on your mm -hmm. platform now, right? Is that correct? That's the most up-to-date data that I have. Yeah, yeah. It's getting bigger and bigger. So, right. you know, I, I used to know every company on it. Now I, I, can, <laughs> honestly say, no, no, I can honestly say I don't. There's not enough space in the brain to hold 25,000 <laughs> ratings. Okay, so uh, yeah. I'm kind of curious about the patterns that have emerged because mm -hmm. how long's all up been going now? Oh, this is about just over two and a half years and had almost the, almost the three uh, at the end of the year. Right. So at the beginning, you knew all the startups by name and now you've got 25,000. It's, you know, this thing has grown rapidly. Mm -hmm. So obviously each startup is an individual case and unique. What are the patterns though that you see with startups? Maybe somebody now thinking, okay, well, this sounds interesting to me. I need to get onto this platform. Or maybe people who have got on there but haven't, you know, recently updated their profiles and so on. Mm -hmm. Is there any quick wins there that can help them 
not necessarily improve their rating, but get more transparency out there. Is there things that sort of startups typically don't look at, which you've now seen with all this kind of, you know, aggregate data and these patterns that you say, okay, that's an area which, you know, in eight out of 10 cases, startups need to look at straight away and they tend not to think mm-hmm. about that. Is there any sort of advice you could offer for a startup joining your platform in terms of what they should get out there first? Sure. Um, it's all about the numbers and I'll talk about particularly numbers in industry, numbers in location, um, and, uh, and how they're tracking from a usability standpoint. There's other things such as net promoter score, which is ultimately yeah. people like what your product is and they're happy to forward it to someone else to, to sell, you know, as in, as, uh, to help you build your customer base. But the number, the numbers that we always see is that, um, uh, people sometimes think from startups is I've raised a million dollars and so um, you know that means I'm awesome. No, it means it means you've raised a million bucks and it's like taking a bigger mortgage out on your on your house. Um, and so the patterns I've seen is typically industry patterns more than anything else. So um, why this is important is that the the startups always get their industry right because industries become pretty much the go to places for for where big money goes to each year. Um, and I'll give you a very, very good example of this. And this is why I always say to startups, get your industry right because that leads you to either fast money, slow money, or no money. Um, and so with industry at the moment, if there was one industry that's getting everyone's attention, it's blockchain slash yeah. cryptocurrency. Everyone's talking about Last year, it was bike sharing. The year before that, it was food delivery. Yeah. You see, there's this pattern. And so if you are in a awesome trend, then you're going to get more attention on the industry. That's the first thing. The second thing is your location and not just the location of where you are, but the location of where you, where you who you sell to. Like there's a lot of companies here in Hong Kong or in Asia that, you know, bulk of their sales are coming from the USA. So it's more about understanding, you know, who your major target market is and ultimately what their spending power is. The next thing is, is just to make sure that, um, even though I, I personally don't think that social is everything, a lot of businesses run on social. And so you make sure that you're, you're, you, you've continuously got people that keep on building your product. Even if it's an extra 10, 20, 30 people signing up to your platform every, every week, that's better than no one signing up to your platform in 101 days. So yeah. you have to, you have to look at the consistency going forward. And so these are the numbers that are very important, um, that we see that leads to people getting investment very quickly versus um, uh, you know, very poorly. Yeah, great advice there. Just to recap, industry, location, social, and I'm sure if we were to go to Odd Up as well and go through the platform, it's going to pretty much direct us in that way to fill out this information and in, in, check the boxes, so to speak. Okay. Yes. <laughs> good. Excellent. Well, that's good to know. Well, I want to talk. I want to change gears a little bit here, James. Sure. Talk about your background mm-hmm. because I think this is important to understand the the whole story and context. Obviously, you are now involved in helping startups and investors match make. You're building this platform. You know, you're providing some value to help both sides of the table, really. Your background is you come from investment banking and you're a qualified lawyer. Mm-hmm. And naturally, that's not the domain of an entrepreneur. You know, you don't find many people who start out as entrepreneurs then say, okay, I'm going to go into investment banking or become, you know, qualify as a lawyer. So I'm curious to know what your trajectory was, you know, (laughs) at what point you decided you were going to go and start your own business. And I want to talk about setting up Odd Up and, you know, your funding rounds Mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. At what point was it that you said, I want to go and do my own thing in your career? Oh, this is a really good question. I think it's if you have to go back a few, I mean, a few years, I'm 40 now. So a few years before that, um, when I was younger, I had my, I guess the biggest inspiration of my life has been my father. Um, because uh, my father has been an entrepreneur. He came to Australia with nothing but a suitcase and, you know, worked hard jobs and became successful that way. And so entrepreneurship has always been in the blood because I saw it all my life um, and still see it now. Um, and, he was an Italian you know, entrepreneur? He was a good Italian entrepreneur. Yeah. So, did he set up a coffee shop in Melbourne? I, I wish he did, but actually he, <laughs> he, he got into trade. So he, he sort of built a trade sort of and then real estate sort of business out of that. So um, that was sort of how it started. Um, and so I saw a lot of also my aunts and uncles who came to Australia who, you know, worked on their own business because, you know, they couldn't get a job in, in finance, but, you know, they, they, you know, they soon grew from there. And, you know, one of the things I actually never really wanted to do law, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with that. People sort of know. 
know me know that. But my father was always on my case going, you've got to do law, you've got to do law. I didn't work all my, all my years for you to sort of become what I am. So maybe it's gone full circle. But uh, I, I got a law degree and, you know, of course, uh, in intellectual property, which is something I'm very, very passionate about anyway. Um, but, you know, it, my career has always sort of evolved about, you know, if I'm going to work for something, I'm going to get it. And so I remember uh, sort of as I grew through at the years, you know, I worked in corporates and I, I think I've worked at – if I look at my CV, it's probably some of the best companies in the, on the planet because I worked to get there. But I think once I was, uh, you know, sort of in my mid thirties and, you know, at JP Morgan and then on to Goldman, I sort of thought, you know, is this the life I want to live or am I going to do something better with my life? Am I going to build something that can be remembered by? And I always remember my first boss, Dieter Buchhorn, actually, who's no longer with us, but he said, you know, and this was, and this was probably the thing that shaped my career besides my father the most. Um, so he was at uh, Siemens Business Services, which was my first job, and he was working for 38 years. And I remember going to him and saying, this was when I was 22 at the time, you know, you should, must be so proud. You should be so happy. That's good. And then he just said, James, no one ever reads your resume when you die. Wow. And they were probably the most important words wow. I ever, ever heard at a 22 year old. And that's pretty much where I've said, okay, well, do I want to be remembered by mm. the guy that worked, went in many meetings in a corporate or do I want to be the guy who goes, oh, that guy started odd up and that's helped a lot more people than just, you know, a couple of meetings. And so that's pretty much what's shaped where I've gone. So I've done what I needed to do to build that expertise. And now I'm using that in my own sort of baseline. Wow, those are powerful words from your former boss. Did that, yes. in a way, did that sort of scare you into action? Or did you just sort of plant a seed which sort of later on flourished and became, you know, the 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 motivation you needed to go and start on your own? Oh, absolutely. It was motivation. To me, it was you know, there was more words that came from that, which was learn, learn from the best. Yeah. Um, and I mean, if you hear Jack Ma, he pretty much says what he said, but I just heard it 20 years earlier than what Jack Ma told the word. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's, it's pretty much, you know, learn as much as you can and then do something with your life. And that's, and that's ultimately what Odd Up's about. It's me, if, if at the end of this day and, you know, Odd Up has become a big company and I'm no longer with it, I could still look at it and go, wow, you know, I've made this company, you know, help make this company what it is. And, you know, it's been the best experience of my life. Yeah. And the, the career path that you took to get to Odd Up, and we'll talk about Odd Up in a minute, is, is interesting because there is a narrative and a dominant narrative in the media of, typically you know two it's you two young guys and it's off, often always guys coming out of stanford you know in their shorts and sandals and you know they walk into an accelerator five million in funding they've never had a job in their life and this is their <laughs> first real attempt at starting a business right and they haven't gone through that process which you talk about learning mm -hmm. which is almost like you know becoming an understudy to somebody else in the industry and they teach you everything that works and to be on the inside to take a corporate job I think there's a lot of pressure for young people today to avoid that world because they feel that that's not the route that they need to take to become a successful startup. But what we often find is that the most successful startups are the people who have had that experience mm -hmm. for a number of reasons. There's personal reasons they know what you know they have to go back to if it doesn't work out, but also they know the challenges that face these companies and they've learned they well effectively they've been bankrolled for ten or twenty years in their education. You, look, that's really important. And so if you look at a lot of the, and I'll just use Asia for now, a lot of the entrepreneurs at Asia that are very successful, most of them are in their mid to late 30s yeah. or later, um, particularly in China, because this world, I mean, I, I always think that, that the stories of these, you know, computer programmers that get funding, it's great. People sort of forget what happens at Series A and Series B where they may have, you know, they, there's very few Mark Zuckerbergs of, of the world. Hmm. It happens very rarely, but a lot of those companies just fail. They've got a lot of money and fail, um, but the system helps them, I guess, integrate and, and try and fail and, and, and start again. But having experience is the key thing. So I, I always, I always, I think, you know, people want to do an MBA to learn stuff. I think starting a startup is the best MBA on the planet. And so um, if for young founders who think this is the career path, that's great. But there's also other things that you need to know besides programming, I business managing, HR, you know, hiring, firing, all these sort of things that, 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 that come with the startup that you just are not prepared for. Um, I've had a fair bit of experience, but still, even with my experience, 
um, there's a lot of things in ODOP that I wasn't used to or what ready for. And so this is the hard journey and you learn these things on the job and you've got to learn it fast. So my advice to entrepreneurs is if you're going to do this, no matter what your age is, you may be right for it. No matter, I'm not going to, I'm not going to judge what age they are, but we'll learn from other entrepreneurs, learn as much as you can. If your knowledge is not at the corporate, learn from, you know, your Invatas, your We Labs, or whatever in the world to learn as much as you can because you'll need their help. Trust me, you'll need their help. Yeah, great advice. Let's talk about when Odd Up became Odd Up. When did it start? Where were you when the idea was floated? Was it uh, just something that came out of the blue? Was it something that was... I'm always curious about how these startup ideas mm-hmm. actually come to be. Was it a conversation you were having? Was it... Tell us a little bit about how the, the genesis of Odd Up started. Now, now, the story I would love to tell you is that I woke up and there was a platform already <laughs> built, but I know that's a lie and it didn't happen. But I can tell you the stories because previously I was in an investment firm um, and we had some success initially on. But the reason probably for the success was I was you know, learning from my time at Goldman and writing research reports around the companies that I wanted to invest in. And so the, uh, the LPs of the funds would ask, Oh, can I have a copy of that? You should sell it. Can I have a copy of that? You should sell it. So it was something sort of the merging of investment and and research at the same time. And so when more and more people said, I'm happy to pay for this, this is really good stuff, I thought maybe there's a business in here. Because, and it was actually a really, really happy hobby. And so the hobby turned into a business. And so um, I guess that's been one of the things that I've been focused on is, you know, try and make this the best business hobby I could ever have, um, but a real business at the same time. So that's really how it sort of genesis, uh, you know, sort of the genesis came through and it was uh, a success from there. Right. Why didn't you continue that within the world of investment banking? You know, you said you were doing it as a hobby, <laughs> you were giving it to the limited partners and there was a value in it. You would have had far much, much more reach and much more support doing it through Goldman Sachs. Uh, yes and no. Yes, because I would have had a bigger sort of canvas at the time, but no, I couldn't shape what it looked like. Right. And so when you look at an investment bank, there's a lot of things such as auditing, corporate governance, uh, KYC, AML, everything under the sun that an investment bank needs to deal with. And so uh, a report for us could take two hours to put together. A report at, at, at Goldman could take two months to put together in order to go through all the legal checks and balances. And that to me is not really fast and innovative because the opportunity may have gone by then. And so, uh, you know, yes, admittedly, they, at the time when I, when I was thinking of this idea, it would have had probably more reach. But now I think we've got more reach. And that's, I think, the journey that you do as a startup. So when you walked out of Goldman, mm-hmm. did you walk into, uh, you know, an idea which was already solidified, which was ready to go, where you had a team ready where you had funding lined up no, what was it actually no, like no. stepping out of the corporate world into the world of startups I, I think I cried the first couple of weeks because I didn't get paid at all um, <laughs> because you know a salary is a wonderful thing and going from a, uh, an investment bank to nothing is, is, is a real hard sh- uh, right. change and I, I remember sort of I remember I, you know, literally three days afterwards, I went on a plane and went to, went to the Middle East and, and then Turkey because I just thought, let's get out just to see the world. Um, you know, I had to sell a house, uh, to fund this. You know, these are sort of things that you need to do and make the hard calls to get there. And then, of course, you know, <laughs> at the time it was very, you know, crap, am I doing the right thing? And now, of course, it's, it's, it's ended up being the right thing. But um, it, there was a lot of caution. I wanted to, I think in the back of my mind, I wanted to become, I, I wanted to be in startups. I just didn't at that point in time. And it probably took about three or four months before I knew exactly what I wanted to do, what I wanted to do. But I, I had to, because I, I, I remember when I walked out of Goldman, I said, this is it. This is the last corporate I ever worked for. And, and I need to make something happen. And so that, that was, I, I wanted to make sure that the decision I made, I kept to my promise because at the end of the day, I was only going to lie to myself if I went against that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's a fascinating chapter in your life. I know you said you grew up around entrepreneurs and your father was an entrepreneur. So obviously it wasn't completely new in your family. You know, mm-hmm. They kind of understood that there were risks to be taken, but your father wanted you to be a, a lawyer. So he mm-hmm. kind of, you know, he took the risk, I guess, to give the comfort and stability to his family. And now you've left one of the best brand investment banks in the world and you put your house on the market. 
I'm just, yes. how do people I laugh around you because react? It's sound, I laugh because, you know, I have to laugh at it now. At the time, I certainly wasn't laughing. Right. You must you have been that. scared. No, you must have been. I mean, what sort of things were going through your mind? People must be saying, James, are you nuts? You're giving this mm -hmm. up to do this? I mean, because the reason why I want to talk about that is because this is a conversation every startup founder is going to face in, face in different kind of levels, right? So I'm curious how you dealt with that and what kind of things were coming your way. Oh, this is a, a great chapter of my life. And the, the, the chapters are still going. I, I think the book of entrepreneurship is every day. Um, and every day is a different chapter. But um, at the time, I, I mean, admittedly, there was, I was scared. I was like, you know, maybe this is a silly idea. And, you know, particularly as we built the first product, it was, you know, people going to buy it and you're making, you know, luckily making $5,000 US a month and going, oh, please buy more. <laughs> you know, this, is not, this is not going to pay my team. Um, and uh, these are sort of the questions you have doubt with your business all the time. But one thing I've learned on this journey um, from the first stage to the second days is usually when it's really good, wait for the real, you know, yeah. the hill to come down. And then, of course, when you unexpected, the hill comes back up again. So it's, you know, it, like all those pictures that you see on LinkedIn where people have, you know, these motivational experiences experiences they're almost 100 percent true it's never a smooth sailing it's always up and down hill um uh, and i remember at the time uh, at least for the first three to six months it was it was very much you know is this the right decision is this the right decision but deep down inside me i knew it was and i had to trust my gut because uh if i didn't then i would always later in life ask myself why why didn't i do it and then have regret and I never, ever wanted to have regret. I'd rather try something and fail, and at least I've tried it, than to, you know, fail and go, or not start it and go, oh, you know, I wish I did this. Yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to be in my deathbed thinking, you know. I, I want to go, okay, I gave it a go, and it, it worked out. Exactly. But you would have a great resume if you didn't, though. <laughs> yeah, stuck out so Goldman, so stuck out investment banking for 30, 40 years, got his gold watch. Yeah. Let's talk about growing odd up. You yes. had a, quite a successful Series A round, six million dollars, right? Um, yes. So, what happened between the way you describe it is when you left investment banking world and you started the business? You know, you went on this, you know, you, you took, jumped on a plane and got out just to kind of decompress, I guess, get some clarity, and then you had this sort of three to six months, three months, six months where you, you kind of knew you wanted to be in startups, but you probably didn't have a, a concrete idea of what the product was that you could add the most value with you kind of knew maybe but it needed a bit of formation and testing so what happened in that time between really just having an idea which was being formed to raising six million dollars i mean that's quite a successful trajectory you talk about going up and down but that's up on the long term what happened in your startup story did you you know get the right people on board i mean because this is what people want to know. What happened that made that successful when, you know, the other 95% of startups that go through the same process fail? I, I look, this is really, really, really hard uh, question for each team, for me to give a universal thing that works for everyone. I can only talk about my own experience. But look, my co-founder, uh, Jackie, who, Jackie Lamb, who's, you know, I've worked with her since my time at Deloitte. So we've been friends for a long time. Um I know what I'm brilliant at and I know what she's brilliant at and I couldn't do what she does and she can't do what I do. And so you need to build a team that complements you but helps you do stuff that you're not good at. A CEO is very much responsible for helping raise money, building profile, setting the strategy, but then you need an operations head who's basically running the company for you. And then you need people – who are, in, are very good in tech, very good in finance. And you, you're looking at a, a whole stream of people. But I always say start up with five people, including the founding team, of very strong people who are very passionate about it and then build from there. And so, uh, you know, uh, one of the things, you know, to where, you know, when you mentioned the um, six million from a Series A, yes, it's wonderful. That happened this year, of course. But, you know, we started this project probably in 2014. And so it was three years before this all happened. So um, uh, um, uh, so that was one of the things that we were very, um, uh, you know, conscious of where do we get there before fun fundraising. Um, and so... Um, uh, uh, look, I can't give you a universal 
sort of this is what you can and can't do. Yep. But what I can tell you is that um, in, a startup should really look at their founding team and look at what they're good at and what they're not good at and then build from there. Um, so and then said, eventually there's things So I just wanted to jump in because you said your founding team, there was you and your co-founder, Jackie. Yep. And you said five people. So just curious to know at what point you got those people together. How, how sort of far into the journey were you before you got that management team together? Oh, goodness me. Probably uh, three to four months into it. It was originally just three people and then it became four and then it became five and then it became six. But, you know, we, we weren't sufficiently funded at that point in time or had enough money and revenue to justify spending, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of Hong Kong dollars a month paying people. Um, and so this is part of the, 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 the process of don't overcapitalize immediately. Just make sure you do the right thing um, to begin with, i.e., um, you know, raise, raise the, so raise capital when you're ready and the product's proven. So when a lot of the startups sort of start that journey, I always say is get the product right, get customers, make the product work and then start adding oil to that and making the fire moving faster. Yeah. Great advice all around. I want to, I want to talk about what makes great startup locations as well. We've talked mm -hmm. about what makes a startup successful. You consciously moved from Melbourne and now you're in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about why you chose Hong Kong a base. And then maybe we can talk a bit about, different cities around Asia because that sort of neatly folds into our tour as well. So you're based in Hong Kong now. Why did you choose Hong Kong? Um, Hong Kong chose me. You know, I always say that I came to Hong Kong for love and the love of money and that was that was JP Morgan at the time. So, um, uh, you know, it wasn't for family circumstances by any means. It was, it was purely for banking. And then, of course, I left Goldman. And then, you know, I was still at, in Hong Kong at the time. I thought, you know what? I could start, I could start odd up in, in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And so I started an odd, uh, odd up in Hong Kong. And one of the good things about that was that when we started odd up, you know, the startup scene in Hong Kong was just starting. So we yeah. benefited from a lot of PR, a lot of publicity where we wouldn't have got that in the Valley, for instance, or London. So so um, this has been probably to our advantage um, as as uh, as where we started. Um, where we end, anyone's guess, but you know Hong Kong will always be in the DNA. If we uh, you know we IPO, we move to San Francisco or London or what have you, it's going to be the nature of the, the journey of the company, not necessarily uh, anything in you know anything against Hong Kong or so forth. Yeah. I mean, I love Hong Kong personally. We talked about we chatted about Hong Kong off air before we started. Mm -hmm. It's a great city. I'm, you know, one of the things obviously that's important for making Hong Kong, Hong Kong or any city, a great startup city is, is the availability of talent. And um, there's no doubt a lot of talent in Hong Kong. The challenge, I guess, with Hong Kong, as maybe the same with Melbourne as well, mm -hmm. compared to maybe other cities in Asia, is that they already have quite well established and successful sectors outside of the startup world. I mean, so, I mean, Australia has, you know, a booming uh, financial sector, and you've got, you know, the mining sector and so on. And in Hong Kong, you have obviously the financial industry as well. So one of the, the conversations that comes up a lot in Asia Tech podcast is, you know, when you're a graduate and you decide to graduate, you know, where does the best talent go? So, you know, mm. why would somebody go and start a startup when they could go and work in the banking world, you know, and have a great career there? So how has it been in Hong Kong with attracting talent when you're up against, you know, very successful established industries? <sighs> I breathe with frustration. It's very, very hard because um, it depends on the location and the sort of the risk. In Hong Kong, you know, my enemy is not the, the the person who wants to work for me. My enemy is their parents, and so the parents are very much like you get to work at a good job. You know, it sounds like my father um, or mother. You got to work at a big company um, because they think you know that is a good thing. Whereas working for a startup, you know, we've it's very hard to convince talent to leave a comfortable, safe job. No matter how, even if we pay them 20, 30, 40% more than what they would get, they would still choose safety. And so for finding talent is good as long as the talent's willing to take a chance. Um, in Hong Kong especially, it's very, very, very hard to convince good talent 
to not want to go to a corporate. Um, that will change over time as we have exits, as people have made a lot of money and so forth, but it's still a long, long process. And that's, that's Hong Kong's fault and I guess the nature of Hong Kong in general. Yeah. But other locations, you know, it, it's more about the opportunity and, you know, and you've seen it particularly in China where, you know, the, the, the loyalties to the company, the team from, uh, you know, what they're achieving because there's so much other opportunity out there. But, you know, Hong Kong has been against the eight ball, but it's only now that people are seeing companies daily that they go, okay, this startup seeing something real. It's it's taking off. So getting that talent is exceptionally hard. I can't I can't begin to say that it's the hardest and most frustrating thing about running a company. Yeah, it's real though. It's that's one of the the challenges facing any startup. And I, I'm I'm based here in Tokyo, and people naturally assume, especially people maybe of our generation, James, you're 40, I'm 45. Mm. When they look at Japan, they think of Japan as a leader in technology. And and you know we've grown up with brands like Sony, for example, which were back in the day, as you know as prominent as people at Apple today. So when people think of Tokyo, they think, well, that must be a great place for startups. But when they get here, exactly what you said, that natural tendency towards risk is, is not there because, you know, the parents are saying, you know, why the hell do you want to go and work for a startup when you can be a doctor or you mm -hmm. can be an accountant? So that, that's a challenge. So let, let's take that conversation out and look at different places in the world, different cities mm -hmm. that you're now expanding into because you, you're, you recently launched in Bangalore in India. Yeah, which is amongst the other two. Yeah, Mumbai and Delhi. So wow. um, we launched all three in, uh, late July mm -hmm. and it was it was incredibly eye opening. And, you know, India has been a humongous success for us, which we never expected. And so we're going to jump on that. So, you know, we've had some great support there and, you know, building a very, very, a very big team very fast in both Bangalore and Mumbai. Mumbai and um, that's been you know it's been if you asked me three years ago that we would be you know on front page of paper we would be um, you know building a team in India I would have said you are mad there's no chance that would happen but you know never say never is the thing I've learned in this game <laughs> and so we're in India and India has been wonderful and so um, uh, but the, when we talk about locations there's so many good locations in, in Asia people just need to know which is the best location for their yeah. startup. And I can talk about that if you'd like me to, because this is a question a lot of people ask us about. Let's Where talk should about I start my startup? You know. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's talk about it. I mean, obviously, it's there are specifics, aren't there? You know, if you're in fintech, you would go here. Mm -hmm. If you're, you know, and so on. I know it's putting you on the spot a little bit and talking generics, but just give us a, you know, maybe feeling for cities which you feel are great places to start startups and reasons why. Sure. Sure. Um, I always say look at the industry first, and I think I mentioned that before in, uh, in this podcast. And so if I was to look at – I'll use Hong Kong as a base. Um, I wanted to start a fintech company. You are going to get a lot of people who support you on that because it's a finance city. However, if I was in, uh, let's say, Sydney and I want to do a hardware product, I would say – with the same team, the same funding, everything the same, you have a better chance in Shenzhen. And that just is just what you've got available to you. So time after time after time, we've seen place uh, companies, startups work well in locations that is very favorable to the industry. And I, I, I can't stress this enough. So if you – people are going to go where their customers are, but if your product that you're creating is in a particular city, then go where that, go where that product can be better created, i.e., um, you're looking at, you know, fintech uh, and logistics in Hong Kong, uh, hardware in Shenzhen, creativity in Melbourne, uh, stuff like um, uh, media in Singapore and Kuala Lumpur, you know, and, and, and you see what I'm talking about. So as long as the industry works in the industry that it's historically been successful for, one, it will be better for your company. Two, you'll get talent there because they've already working in that industry. And, and three, you'll get the investors that already like that industry anyway because they've made money from it previously. So a lot more factors work for you if you're in the right industry city. Yeah, for sure. Without naming Melbourne or Hong Kong because you're biased. <laughs> Are there any... Not biased. I love them all. I love all the cities in Asia. <laughs> right. Okay. So let's put you on the spot. Are there any cities? Where, I mean, we all know Singapore as a great place to start a startup because, you know, the, the scene there is exploding. In Asia, in particular, outside of the obvious candidates, are there any cities, I mean, maybe the ones that Odop is now present in that really excite you? You mentioned Bangalore as one, for example, that we we will find out more about in the next two or three years because, you know, the startup scene is just exploding there. 
Um, I would say that people shouldn't look at the obvious ones. They should look at the, the non-obvious ones. Ho Chi Minh, Ho Chi Minh City is one obvious one for me. Probably not for most of your listeners. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's purely because uh, China is moving a lot of their manufacturing to Vietnam. You're going to build a new Shenzhen in in reality there, um, and so a lot of these factories are now moving to to Vietnam because of the cost of labor in China is becoming expensive. And so you'll see China companies becoming more state of the art, i.e. the DJIs of the world, versus Ho Chi Minh, where you're going to build some more sort of grassroots manufacturing Kickstarter type projects. So I see a lot of growth in Ho Chi Minh City. Jakarta and Indonesia are very interesting places at this point in time. Um, and other places, I guess in India, I'd say Delhi and Mumbai are very much growing, particularly Mumbai has got the most growth. Uh, and there's a lot of other cities across um, across. Uh, Asia at this point in time that are doing doing well, but you know if I certainly was going to go where I'm going to get the biggest return, Ho Chi Minh and T- Jakarta uh, and probably Mumbai are your three big cities there. Fantastic, you heard it here first. James is long on those cities, as you say. I mean, it's such an exciting ecosystem generally, and what you're doing with Olop as well, I think, is a fantastic project. I mean, it's a fantastic value add to the ecosystem. You're really, I mean, one thing we talk a lot about Asia Tech Podcast is professionalizing the startup ecosystem and you're bringing that knowledge in from, you know, what you've learned in other industries that maybe is lacking in the startup ecosystem now and you're helping people make sense of it and especially sense of a lot of change. And as we've discussed, it's not just for the investors, it's also for the startups. And now they're coming on board and seeing the value in this rating ecos this rating system. It's gonna help them shape their startups and grow in a specific way that's gonna interface nicely with that investment community. Hey, that's James Giancotti, everybody, CEO of OddUp. James, before you go, share with us a link or links that would be useful for listeners because they wanna find out more about you. Sure. Look, the easiest thing to do is go to oddup.com, O-D-D-U-P.com. You'll find out a lot about me, find out a lot about the companies. And, you know, if your company's not there, make sure you submit it and we'll put it on, on the platform and get investors looking at it straight away. Can any company submit to Odd Up? Do they have to be for a certain stage just so people know? No, that? no. As long as they're being in one of the cities, i.e. all of Asia, then it'd be fine. Um, uh, but we we'll soon will uh, allow every every location on the planet to be able to do that. So um, at the moment, it's up until, say, everywhere from Mumbai to Melbourne to um, uh, to Beijing and everything in between that. And so um, as long as you're there, we're more than happy. As long as you're in one of those cities, we're more than happy to put you on our platform. Right. Well, that's a big enough footprint. James, please come back on the show show because you know as you said you just open up in india well that's a billion people added to the footprint i mean it's just going to grow from here isn't it so james thank you so much for coming on the show sharing your journey with us and sharing information about odd up as well as the startup ecosystem in asia really enjoyed that that's james jan cotty everybody james thank you very much thanks graham much appreciated you've been listening to asia tech podcast Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.